Hello, my spooky friends. I'm Blair Bathory, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. Thank you for joining us, whether it's your first time delving into the darkness or if you are brave enough to make a return visit. Welcome. Urban legends, ghost stories, and tales of the supernatural. At Something Scary, we love to bring you different kinds of horror stories from storytellers around the world. In honor of Pride Month, we'll be raising up the voices of some incredible writers from the LGBTQ community. Make sure you tune in to hear the creepy tales they have to tell. We're constantly surrounded by false standards of beauty on social media that can trick us into believing that external beauty is more important than what's on the inside. When we don't know where the fake narrative ends and the truth begins, we leave the door open for demons to enter our mind, body, and soul. First, a fountain of death, followed by there are no shortcuts. Then, killer competition. Finally, in our featured story, there's only one queen bee. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary at snarled.com. If you'd like to support Something Scary, then consider joining our Patreon. As a patron, not only can you help the show and see ad-free episodes, but you can also be a part of the horror and hear your name featured in one of our podcast or weekly video stories. Visit patreon.com slash snarled. So, want to hear something scary? The Price of Beauty. Sometimes, what's beautiful on the outside is rotten to the core on the inside, like in this story inspired by Visanti. Beauty by Beverly was a global sensation. Bev Hardby had been a struggling single mother, tired of food stamps and hand-me-downs. She began making and selling her own organic skincare. Within three years, Bev was a successful multimillionaire and a woman who others looked up to, a real inspiration for other startups. Not only was she a successful businesswoman, despite being 51 years old, she looked more like she was 28. Her skin was flawless, with practically no lines or signs of aging. She swore she had had no work done or used any fillers or Botox. She simply looked like a woman in her late 20s, and women who wanted to know her secret flocked to her conferences. Sita Higaman, a devout follower of Bev's beauty movement, was attending her first in-house seminar in hopes of working for the company. Sita was drawn to anything organic, so her ethos of using natural products appealed to her. She also had an eye for marketing. Per her application, she was invited to the seminar and introduced to the multi-level marketing strategy. Having struggled with money her whole life, she looked up to Bev and was inspired by her story. She wanted to be a part of whatever this company had to offer. Arriving at the seminar was a dream come true. When she walked into the convention center, there were 200 people dancing to music like a Tony Robbins mega event. Sita was ushered to the front row where she noticed a lot of other young recruits sitting. When Bev came out and spoke, she hung on every word, soaking up the energy in the room. Bev took a shine to the front row praising them for their hard work through the application process. After the day had ended, she invited all of them to a private dinner where she was going to select the future employees. Sita was thrilled. Sitting at a large oak table with Bev at the head, she couldn't believe her good fortune. Large wine bottles were being passed around like water washing down the decadent meal. Sita was not used to such luxury and she paced herself. But it was quickly obvious that while Sita sipped her wine, the rest of the recruits were getting drunk out of control. Two of them passed out right at the table and all Bev seemed to do was smile. Then another two slid down the chairs and another one fell face first onto the table. By this time, Sita had also begun to feel impaired. She couldn't move her body, but although she was still conscious, she was the only one of the guests with her eyes open, although her vision had become blurred. 
That's when Bev signaled for four men in plastic suits who resembled surgeons or crime scene investigators to enter the room. The men got fast to work, seemingly having done this many times before. They moved the unconscious guests and lay them on the table face up. Then they pulled out a mini circle saw and went to work, chiseling off the attendees' youthful faces. Blood splattered everywhere. Bev smiled, observing their work. Her eyes scanned the room, finally noticing Sita. She walked over to her, kneeling right in front of the paralyzed yet conscious woman. Oh, you poor thing. You must be terrified. A tear fell from Sita's eye. Bev gently wiped it away. Don't worry, it'll be painless. You see, the only way for one to truly bottle youth is to retrieve it from a living donor. And with a swift move of her arm, Bev plunged a needle into Sita's neck. Within seconds, she was out cold and true to Bev's word, she never felt a thing. The remains of the seven bodies were never found, but 4,000 jars of youthful elixir went on to sell the following month. Bev's secret was safe, her business booming, and the women who bought her products weren't likely to care where the night cream came from as long as they could continue to look 20 years younger. People often tell me I have the skin of a corpse. What's my secret, you ask? Never go out during the day. And how far would you go to fit the beauty standards of today? And what are your tricks and tips to stay youthful? Let me know by sending us an email to somethingscary@snarl.com. Some people seem to have it all. The looks, the charm, the complete package of high school popularity, but nothing comes for free, and sometimes the price can be hellish, as in this story written by Janine Pipe. Tessa looked enviously at her classmate, Lily. Over the last few weeks of senior year, Lily seemed to have discovered a miracle beauty regimen, showing up to school each day looking more like a Maybelline model than a high schooler. She'd always been popular, but now she was off the charts. Whilst the majority of teens were concentrating on their studies, sports, or getting extra credit for college, Lily seemed to be undergoing physical changes. Tessa became obsessed with looking at her. Had her teeth always been that straight? Was her hair always that shiny? Maybe she should just ask Lily what she was doing. Whatever it was, it was certainly working and at an almost alarming speed. Tessa took the long route home after school, steadfastly avoiding the popular hangouts. As much as she envied the crowd, she couldn't bring herself to be in the same place as they were and be completely ignored. Once at home, she endlessly scrolled through social media, coveting the lives and the loves of others, instead of focusing on her studies or focusing on her own friendship choices. Although she'd never been close with Lily, they did share several classes together, including English. Tessa was surprised when Lily came over and joined her at the table where she was quietly pretending to read. Without saying a word, Lily slipped her a post-it note with an odd email address on it. As she walked away, looking as flawless and perfect as ever, Tessa somehow implicitly understood Lily was sharing the secret to her popularity. She just wasn't sure why. That evening, Tessa sat at her computer. The post-it note stuck on the screen. Finally, her curiosity got the better of her and she logged into her email account and quickly composed a message. Hi, my name is Tessa. I'm 17 and a senior at Woodboro High. She paused and then continued. I think you can help me. Send. Just as she was wondering whether she could unsend the ridiculous email, her inbox flashed, showing a new reply. Package has been sent. Huh? What package? Sent where? She hadn't supplied an address or given any payment details. Hi, it's Tessa again. I think there's been a mistake. I haven't ordered anything from you. Thanks. She hit send again. Immediately, the message came back. Mail error. This email does not exist. After unsuccessfully trying a couple more times, 
Tessa racked it up as being a prank. Lily had set her up and she had fallen for it. She eventually drifted off to sleep, wondering why the girl she idealized would do that. Tessa got ready for school quietly the next morning. Her mom had already left for work. When she opened the front door to leave, there was a package addressed to her. Her first thought was maybe it was from the college she would be attending. Textbooks? She took it inside and opened it up. It was a small machine that seemed to resemble a miniature vacuum. Tessa, as discussed, this will give you what you want. There was also a crude instruction diagram. It showed the Hoover being switched on and the nozzle attached to her belly button. She turned the paper around and on the back was a drawing that startled her. It was her, but a poised, shiny, confident looking version. Flashes of sun-kissed, always camera ready, Lily popped into her mind and almost robotically, Tessa headed with the machine to the bathroom. There, she stripped down to her underwear and without considering a plug socket or thinking about batteries, flicked the switch and attached the nozzle to her belly button as per instruction. The machine quickly got to work. Tessa barely noticed that the skin around her navel had stretched and was getting bigger as the Hoover plunged deeper into her guts. She was trance-like, watching in wonder as first yellow fat was sucked from her body, followed by red as blood began to flow and varying other colors as organs passed through the tubing. Just before she died, Tessa thought she heard the click of the door, the pull of the nozzle being removed. Her very last sight before the light faded from her eyes was something retreating from the bathroom, Hoover in hand. When her mom returned from work and discovered her daughter, Tessa was nothing more than a shriveled husk of skin and bone. Every ounce of blood, fat, muscle, and organ had been siphoned from her body. Lily, of course, felt bad when she heard the news the next day. She didn't like being the one to trick her victims, but there was always a price for eternal popularity. The Crossroads demon made sure of that. The magic Hoover contraption did nothing. It was simply a torture device he'd brought from hell. He didn't need any blood, just souls, but it amused him anyway. Till next time. He croaked into Lily's ear. And as she scrolled through Insta and saw she'd gone over 100,000 followers, she knew it was a price she was willing to pay. Have you ever wanted something so badly you lost focus of what was important? Have you ever received an unusual package? And did you open it? What was inside? And did you return to sender? Working on our mental health is challenging, but therapy can really help us understand ourselves better. It can also help us figure out why we feel the way we do. And this is something that is so important. I know that sometimes I get busy making my videos and running around, and I just don't take the time to process everything that is happening and going on in my life. A licensed talk space therapist can help you identify what kind of things you need to work on, whether it's help setting stronger boundaries, letting something go, or gaining the courage to try something different. Taking the first step towards getting help can be scary. For anyone who is looking to get started, I recommend Talkspace because they make it really easy to match with a licensed therapist and schedule a session. Talkspace takes some of the pressure off the first step. It's more of a flexible and convenient way to get high quality care. Plus, there are several payment options to choose from. But no matter where you are in your mental health journey, talking to a therapist who's trained to help makes a huge difference. Consider this your permission slip to put your mental health first. Match with a dedicated therapist today at Talkspace.com and use promo code SCARY during the sign-up process to get $100 off your first month. That's $100 off at Talkspace.com, promo code SCARY. In the prestigious all-girls school in Dhaka City, Bangladesh, the students do all they can to be the best and the competition can be killer. Like in this story, inspired by Fariba. Namira was a straight-A student destined for Ivy League and medical school. For the last six years, no one had surpassed the marks Namira received on any given test or report. Students would gather around whenever grades were handed out just to see what Namira got, especially since most of the time she was setting the curve. Every time, it was 95% or over and the class would moan, 
thinking her constantly exceeding expectations was making it harder for them to succeed. So one night, three classmates broke into the chemistry lab, not to steal answers for an upcoming test, but to use the facility to place a curse. It had taken them months to find the elusive 1,500-page centuries-old book. They opened it to a curse detailing how to steal someone's gift. They had personal tokens sorted, a lock of hair from gym class, and her most recent 100% French exam. In addition, they each needed to submit something belonging only to them, a drop of their blood. With everything placed carefully into a bowl and the candles lit in a pentagram structure, the curse was set. They slowly chanted the ancient words and then all they could do was wait and hope. The next day in class, the three teens sat behind a mirror waiting to see if it had worked. The teacher asked a fairly simple question and as expected, Namira's hand shot up. When the teacher called on her, something unusual happened. Namira went blank. The answer stuck in her mouth. When she spoke, the words were gibberish. The class laughed. The three teens who cursed her were thrilled. The look of confusion on Namira's face was heartbreaking. Over the course of the next few days, the curse seemed to be spiraling out of control. Not only could Namira barely speak, her words constantly jumbled. Her motor functions were declining. She couldn't even hold a pen right, using a closed fist and could only make circles. The three teens decided the curse had gone too far and went back to the book to reverse it. But after reading carefully, they realized there was no anecdote, nothing. In fact, the curse they cast would only keep getting worse. The following week, they heard Namira was in the hospital in a coma. She was catatonic with no brain function. Since she was only 15 and had been previously fit and healthy, they knew it had to be the curse. They searched everywhere trying to find a solution and finally stumbled upon a magologist, someone who studies the theoretical ability of magic. They presented their hypothetical case and asked for advice. He advised such a curse would be extremely difficult to break, but it could be done. The caster would need to be offered five times the blood they had given in the original curse to restore balance. The teens solemnly reunited in the chemistry lab late that night. They'd each given five drops of blood to place the curse. Therefore, 25 from every teen was now required. Instead of pricking their fingers, they decided to slice their palms down the middle. The offering was quickly collected, but their bleeding would not stop seeping quickly through the bandages and towels they had brought. It began to pool on the floor. All three were terrified, growing lightheaded and bleeding out within seconds. The next day, the janitor arrived to a horrific scene. And to everyone's surprise, Namira had woken from the coma and was back to her old self, having made an instant and complete recovery. The curse had needed a major sacrifice to be reversed. Drops of blood weren't enough for the damage they had done to Namira's body, and the curse kept taking what it needed to bring Namira back. Within a week, Namira had returned to class, acing tests, and this time, no one dared to compete. How important is it to be the top of your class, and how much would you be able to make someone suffer in order to get what you want? It's better to accept yourself for who you are, rather than trying to hang out with the it crowd, because you may die trying to fit in. My Oma collects a special brand of antique German dolls, the kind that have a porcelain face and are fragile, but she keeps them in pristine condition. Some of these dolls have been in our family for over a hundred years. Each was handmade and dressed in chiffon and lace. On very rare occasions, she would let me hold them and play with them. But this was always supervised because they were so delicate. Bridget was my favorite. She had immaculate brunette hair and these bright green eyes. Her dress was by far the most elaborate, something right out of Bridgerton. My Oma referred to her as the Queen Bee because she was the oldest and most expensive. Around the time I started college, 
I thought of the perfect birthday gift for my oma. There was this antique store near the campus, and they had an assortment of old dolls. I found one I thought was perfect. Her name tag read Lacy. She wasn't a special brand, but it was very similar in style. And while she wasn't cheap on a college budget, she was nowhere near the ticket price of my oma's collection. And it was something we shared and had a love for. So I wanted to get her something that reflected our bond. The night before her birthday, after my ma had gone to bed, I decided to surprise her by placing Lacey with the others in the display case with a tiny little birthday tiara. When I placed her inside, I realized she was a bit bigger than the others and not of the same quality. But it was a gesture I knew Oma would appreciate. As I posed the doll, I noticed one of her eyes was stuck closed and needed to be manually opened. Her hair wasn't as stylish as the other dolls and her clothes were a little tatty. She clearly had been played with frequently by the previous owner, but she was still cute and roughly from the same era. I sat her right next to Bridget and told the queen bee to welcome Lacey into the fold. During the night, Oma and I were awoken by the shattering of glass. We met in the hallway, turning on all the lamps and making our way to the living room slowly, fearing an intruder. When we turned on the living room overhead light, we saw glass from the display case broken and all over the floor. My immediate thought was that perhaps I hadn't closed the door properly after placing Lacey in the fold. Then Maya Ma looked at the floor. Who's that? She asked sharply. It was Lacey. Only now her face was smashed and her dress torn. Oddly, she was the only doll who was out of the cabinet. Oma ran over and picked her up. Child, what have you done? I explained the doll was her birthday gift, but she began shaking it, telling me that I wasn't allowed to add to the collection and that there were very specific rules. Oma seemed to be fixated on the fact that this doll wasn't good enough nor pretty enough. There was a certain elegance and decorum that must be adhered to. The lecture felt strange coming from the woman who adored me and was always so gentle and calm. She thrust a lacy at me and said something which sent a shiver down my spine. Let's hope they forgive us. I just stared at the mess as Oma began clearing the glass. I picked up Lacey, unable to work out how much damage had been inflicted. And again, why was she the only doll to have been tossed onto the floor? It's almost as if she had been singled out. Oma was still muttering as she threw away the last of the broken glass. She stood before the cabinet, her hands clamped together almost as if in prayer. I'm so sorry, B. She just didn't know. She's just a child still. It won't happen ever again. Was she talking to the dolls? That was when I looked into the cabinet properly. They looked as if they were staring right back at me. And there, right in the center, was Bridget. She seemed to be smirking more than I had ever remembered. Her expression chilled me to the core. But that wasn't what unnerved me the most. B was wearing a new accessory. Now upon her perfect hairstyle was the birthday tiara I had placed upon Lacey. The new doll was now battered and broken and Queen B was wearing the crown. It was the strongest admonishment I'd ever encountered. I turned to Ma, who slowly stepped back from the cabinet she pulled me in for a hug and whispered in my ear, no more dolls. They don't like it. You won't get another warning. This week's podcast stories were edited by Sarah Lukasiewicz and Janine Pipe. Narration by Blair Bathory and Stephanie Strange. 
Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Irma Richardson. Produced by Annie Villabos. Music by Sapphire Sindalo and Calvin Linderman. Gail Gilman is the executive producer.